Hi everyone, yeah. I'm Kieran Patel, I'm a Solutions Marketing Manager at AWS, so I kind of my primary responsibility is looking after the media solution, so that uh, will include uh, all of the AWS Elemental, the media services that were launched a couple of years ago, and uh, the other Elemental appliances that are still uh, included within that kind of suite of Elemental products, but also the wider AWS suite. Uh, which has a lot of applications within media workflow. So very rarely does anything get used in isolation. You want to pair a lot of them together. Uh, and that's kind of what I'll be kind of touching on here. So uh, getting straight into the kind of uh, architectural look at things. Uh, if you're designing a kind of a live streaming workflow, uh, this isn't necessarily kind of definitive, but we're kind of I'm trying to break it down into kind of the pillars that you should think about it as a logical steps uh, along that workflow. Now, a lot of people won't need to have every single one of them, and equally, not every one of them needs to be a separate component within that workflow. You can have a lot of overlap, you can skip steps, but uh, I thought this was a good starting point in thinking that if you wanted to utilize the cloud as a part of that live streaming infrastructure, you want to be thinking about getting that in code uh, from a baseband video into something that's IP, uh, to then switch that to something that you can get into the cloud to start with, and that's that transport step. You still need to do the ABR encode for delivering for uh, OTT delivery, uh, and then a packaging and origination, which commonly is a single step, but it's actually two distinct steps normally, which is one that's saying, uh, I'm gonna make this content in, uh, deliverable to the different devices that need to be uh, playable on, and equally I need to have somewhere that to originate that content that multiple CDNs ideally can pick up from to do the distribution step at the end, and then you've got your uh, clients at the very end of the chain and a camera at the beginning of the chain which I couldn't fit on uh, to the diagram. Now, the traditional way of getting uh, a lot of these kind of live streaming workflows to be uh, more resilient and more reliable is to kind of just duplicate those steps out, is to have kind of multiple uh, components of multiple pieces of infrastructure doing every step along that chain or doing groups of those steps along the chain uh, and then having the failover be switching from one set of components over to another set of components. And I think what the cloud gives you is an interesting way of looking at it is it not necessarily having say going from a light blue to a dark blue to a darker blue and having failover do nothing but think of uh, think of switching between entire legs, but thinking about failover within individual sets. Uh, and then there were talks yesterday uh, looking at the concept of kind of microservices, and it's not quite that far, but it's if you look at the individual steps along that workflow and then think of failover between each individual steps along that workflow, you can build something that's a lot more resilient and reliable than the kind of a traditional workflow where you're having just a kind of an A and a B leg and your failover is essentially switching between one and the other. Uh, so the kind of the core message that we'll go on to, we have some examples that I want to go through as well, but it's like, you know, your resilience is basically built out of having redundancy and then failover between that redundancy. Uh, and that simple form of that is just to have a duplicate of what you're building uh, and then switching manually between the A and then the B. But what we want to get to, I think what the cloud can enable, is having a better form of that resilience, which is having something which is a cloud-native architecture, which utilizes some of the auto-scaling that's possible, some of the healing that's possible with auto-scaling groups uh, when you're kind of architecting that way, and then trying to get as much of that failure to be automatic as well. So the, the reason this slide kind of enabled it for chaos is Netflix made famous within a lot of their architecture, which they've open sourced, this concept of chaos engineering which is the, uh, the idea that you're gonna have a steady state, which from a live streaming point of view should be that your audiences continue to be able to watch your live output. Uh, and regardless of any disruptions within that uh, architecture or workflow that you've got, so if components are failing or if network connections are failing, as long as your audiences can carry on watching that live stream, you've developed an architecture which essentially is kind of a, uh, chaos monkey proof, so you know you can have you can be killing components within there, and your audience still watches the live stream. So that should be the goal, uh, not having to, n not noticing something has failed, or making sure your audience doesn't notice something has failed, even if you do. And then you can concentrate on fixing it, knowing that you haven't actually impacted your uh, your actual end user, uh, and then getting essentially back up to that full level of resilience or redundancy. Uh, with an invisible impact to your end user, and then you're, you're hitting your targets of being up, uh, ideally 100% of the time, if you're looking at a kind of a 24-7 uh, streaming scenario. So I've got a couple of examples that look at this in different ways. So the first one is using the cloud for origination, but actually still using a, a more of an on-premise uh, system for encoding. So you've got the camera on, the, on my right, your left, 
uh, feeding into two encoders. So uh, Elemental have a nice feature where you can have multiple encoders producing identical outputs. They call it output locking. So it lets you uh, reference a set another encoder, uh, and then you know that both of those encoders are producing identical output. They can then all be writing. So in this scenario, I'm going to put those pillars in at the bottom there. You're skipping the step of having to do a mezzanine encode because you'll have your uh, on-premises encoder potentially producing your ABR stack and packaging that ABR stack to say HLS because that's your primary concern. You can deliver then that to the origin service that we have, which is Media Store, and then that's a kind of an optimized storage layer that is great for being an origin for multiple <coughs> VPNs or for uh, live traffic. So. S3 is a great storage product. This is built on top of S3, so you get a lot of the durability and the availability that S3 provides. Uh, but the enhancement that Media Store gives you is the kind of immediate consistency. So if you're uh, using, say, HLS, especially if you want to optimize for low latency, you're kind of writing to that uh, storage layer a lot. Uh, and you're also writing, say, manifest updates a lot, uh, potentially multiple times every few seconds. And you want to make sure that any client that's picking up or requesting those is always getting the latest version. So not only does the video need to be available as soon as you've said you've written, but you need the latest version of the manifest to be available. Because if anyone gets an old version, you're going to end up with buffering on the device because they're not going to get the reference to the latest bit of video which you've produced as well. So that gives you that uh, essentially a, a fan out of your single source from multiple encoders out to multiple origins in this case. Uh, and having all of those available downstream to the client. Now the failover gets switched here. Uh, so here's where some of the kind of the magic has to happen, which we don't have. Uh, you can build it into a client that can let you switch between CDNs, or you can have, say, traffic management or origin shield layers that will do, uh, manage the logic that will let you switch between multiple origins. Uh, so here you've managed to get from a single source, multiple encoders going out to multiple origins, and essentially that's the equivalent of something like four data centers worth of origin capacity, so like a very redundant uh, solution there, feeding down into a multiple CDNs to a client. So you can afford failures along the chain where, again, your, your target of having your audience and the, the green box at the end watching that stream will continue to, continue to work. And a slightly more complex version uh, is using more of those media services so that the, my right-hand side or your, sorry, your left-hand side looks the same where you've got a, a couple of encoders but here they're going to be uh, using more of those pillars spread out. So they're using the on-premises encoders to produce uh, a mezzanine stream. So it's a high-quality stream that they will transfer into the cloud. They're using a service uh, called Media Connect, which lets you do reliable transport from uh, an on-premises encoder using kind of reliable UDP transport into the cloud, separating not only into regions but into availability zones. So that's the concept that AWS has of Regions are geographically separated and they're available across the world, but each region has at least two, usually three or more availability zones. And those are constructs which are one or more data centers, physical data centers uh, that hold that infrastructure that have reliable network links between them within a region and between regions as well. So in this solution, you've got the Media Connect service that's bringing in the transport of that high quality stream and then sending it to the Media Live, which is the encoding service that takes uh, the high quality stream and then converts it into an ABR stream to be delivered out. So it's a single ABR stream uh, that's giving you your ABR stack for all the different devices. Uh, and then that forwards it on to a Media Package stream, so that gives you the option that the Media Store doesn't, which is that you package as well as originate. So you've got the option of saying, if it, HLS is coming in, you can deliver HLS out, dash out, smooth out if you need to, different flavors of Dash, uh, different implementations of Dash. You can add uh, content protection, so DRM, different versions of DRM, at that layer of the workflow. Uh, and then the failover logic kind of sits across that stream. So one of the things that Media Package will let you do is give two inputs and manage some of the failover itself between the two different inputs. So it can then switch between redundant ingest sources and then if you need multi-region, it will let you put the logic similar to the previous example, either in a traffic management or in a client layer. Uh, but in a lot of examples, actually, this is potentially overkill. I'm going to have a kind of a summary slide at the end, but this level of solution is enough for a lot of people because you've still got a couple of encoders sending content in. You've got essentially a multi-data center stream being produced going out, which will handle failure uh, of infrastructure within a simple concept and then still have a single output that can be 
originated from multiple CDNs on the, uh, before it's distributed. And the reason that works is because we've built a simplified diagram here where media live and media package are just represented as a single box. But they're managed services that are taking care of a lot of the redundancy uh, and failover for you. So media live, when you look at it in detail, uh, it's not, uh, essentially for those that know AWS, it's not an EC2 instance running some package uh, encoding software. It's a full service that's spread across availability zones that's giving you multiple uh, or two inputs as in its standard form that you can read, uh, send your source content into. A single channel configuration that works so you can set your AVR stack up once and it will duplicate that across both of those encoding pipelines. And if you've got time code coming into that stream, it will ensure that those diverse encoding pipelines produce synchronized output on the way out as well. So then you deliver those to two different destinations. Uh, and when you pass that on to media package, that does the same. It's not, again, it's not an EC2 box that's doing all of your packaging and origination. It's a fully managed service that's naturally or natively spread across multiple availability zones within a region. Uh, so a media live or another encoder could be sending in two uh, discrete input streams, uh, and then those are managed or those are ingested into a fleet of ingest resources, uh, there's a uh, combined kind of storage and database that's being managed for you as well. Uh, and then the packaging and the origination happen again across a fleet of resources that are spread across multiple data centers. Uh, the, a lot of the kind of extra features that come with Media Package are then part of that price. So the, the failover that happens, if it registers that one of those sources, so the, one of the, uh, the purple arrows as an input fails at any point in time, it will manage the switch. So you're only ever giving out from a, a CDN or from an origination point of view. Uh, your endpoints have a single, uh, uh, a single URL that you can have as your origin for your CDNs, uh, but they will switch between the two inputs if it registers a failure between the two. And they'll be sticky, so if you don't have synchronized inputs, it won't necessarily flick between them and you won't get a judder. It will notice a failure and you may get a judder if you don't have synchronization that once as you do the failover. Uh, one of the important things to note is if you've got a service, as I said, if you've got a service that's going to be ideally keeping the video running, even if you have interruptions in the workflow, even if you have a failure in a pipeline, or if you have uh, uh, an interruption to an input, you want to make sure that that source uh, or that stream is still monitored and you, at least as an operations point of view, you can see any failures that are happening. So what we've developed is a service called MSAM, or the Media Services Application Mapper. I realized without enough time to fix it, that I haven't put a URL up. But if you search MSAM AWS on Google, you'll get a page full of results that talk about this service. So it's, a, it's essentially open sourced uh, code that we've got published on GitHub that puts a bunch of AWS services together and then will scan your account, look at all the services that you may be using, and draw the logical connections between them. Because from a monitoring point of view, you don't necessarily want to know that Media Live isn't working or Media Package isn't working. You want that logical construct of a this is my channel, this is channel one, it's using all of these services together, this is how they're connected, uh, and then you can draw your uh, uh, kind of operational uh, knock center can be looking at that to say, I have a failure, actually my stream's still working, but this is where I want to focus my effort to ensure that I'm getting back up to 100% resilience, uh, even though there's been some kind of interruption. So you don't have to rely on anyone reporting on Twitter or your, your stream failing, uh, to know that something's gone wrong. You get uh, alerts within each service with context of that uh, affecting this end-to-end -end channel. Uh, even though the channel's still working, you can then focus your effort on ensuring that that, that content gets back up and running. So there was a quick summary at the end which was kind of looking at the kind of things to think about. So there was a lot of information there, uh, some ideals on how to fix things. Uh, but a lot of it is like bringing in questions and then knowing where the trade-offs are. So there's a, a point of deciding what level of redundancy or resilience you want or need. What that means for redundancy, what that means for your kind of failover uh, logic or targets. Uh, and then the kind of re return point and return time objectives. It's like, how quickly do you need to get back? How important is the channel to you? Does it have to be up 100% of the time? If there's a failure, is it okay to be off air for a few seconds or a few minutes? or a few hours before you get it back up and running. Because as with a lot of things, the focus on this was looking at resilience being your top target. And a lot of the time, especially for live, it tends to be right up there with your highest priority. But we're seeing 
Uh, other things come into that mix now. There's a lot of talk, there's multiple sessions over the last few days about uh, latency being like a higher and higher priority. Uh, and one of the things with latency is if the lower you want to get your latency, you do have an impact on how resilient that live stream is going to be. Not necessarily in the sense where it's going to fail, but it's going to give potentially users a poorer user experience because they're not going to be able to buffer content as much. So uh, there's a trade-off when you're making a latency. There's a trade-off you're making in complexity. You know, the, the second, I, second example I showed you had a lot of moving parts. Monitoring all those moving parts gets very <coughs> complex. You can build something that's much simpler, but then that will make it less resilient as well. And equally the cost. So you, know, you can have two, three, four versions of something running uh, in the cloud as well as on-premises to make it more and more resilient. Uh, but then the cost goes up as well as the complexity going up. So all of these kind of factors have to be weighed up to get that, uh, to get that uh, kind of perfect solution or architecture for the needs that you have. And then I think these are the questions uh, that you kind of ask yourself to figure out how that's going to work. And the last one I had is just for information. I wouldn't really expect everyone to read it. It's just questions that come up a lot is that you've got a target you want to hit. Your live stream wants to be up 99% of the time, or five nines is what we hear a lot. Uh, and it's hard to get your head around what that really means. And so I've just kind of done the Excel maths to figure out what that means. If so if you, if you have a target of my live stream wants to be up five nines, so 99.999% of the time, that means you're only willing to accept five minutes, 20 seconds of downtime in a year. So you have to try and architect to get that level. And if you're going down, you know, that's the, the differences that you're kind of, you're designing to be willing to accept. But it's like saying that, saying that you're hitting five nines means, yeah, 25 seconds a month is, is the only acceptable downtime that you're kind of willing to get to. But like I said, most of the time you're trying to hit 100%. So it's kind of gambling on, you've got leg A and leg B. If one of them fails, the other one won't fail at the same time. Or I will fix it within 25 seconds, so I'll be back up to 100% before the other one has a chance to fail. Uh, so I rushed through that very quick. Uh, we do have some demos of this in the show hall as well, and we've got some essays if you've got more kind of in-depth questions about any of the things I talked about. Thanks so much.